Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well and welcome to, depending on wherever you may live or however you choose to read your clock, this early morning or middle of the night bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost you a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads that I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to this early morning or middle of the night bonus upload, shall we? Jeffrey, how are you? I actually just found your channel. I'm enjoying the information you are putting out to the public. My name is Redacted. Please do not use my name ever on your channel because I work for Virginia's DWR, Department of Wildlife Resources, in the Henrico office. I'm reaching out to you to correct the information you shared recently about a supposed dog man under a tarp in the Hungry Mother's State Park vicinity, and a ham radio transmission. First thing is first, two weeks ago on the 7th of June, we received a call from Smith County Sheriff's Office. A mountain biker had seen a bear and was chased. Apparently, he was riding his normal route, which he has biked for about five years. He came to a crossroad, and out it came, no warning, nothing. He was lucky to escape and contacted the sheriffs. Then they contacted our Marion office. Fifteen minutes later, one of our CPOs, or conservation police officer, was heading toward the state park, prepared to deal with a rogue bear, tranquilizers and rifle ready to go. He had tried to contact another officer to accompany him, but they were not available. With that, he asked Smith County Sheriffs for some backup. They were five to ten minutes behind our CPO. For this, let's call our officer Joe. Joe pulls up to the crossroad and gets out, looking for signs of the bear. Joe starts to walk into the tree line he thought the bear had entered. Joe had got maybe 30 to 40 feet into the woods. When he hears a growl, he later told me it did not sound bear-like more like a large wolf, a very deep growl. He starts to look around 360 degrees as he turns back toward the direction he was going. Something huge dropped on top of him. Joe woke up in the back of an ambulance on a stretcher. The paramedics told him that he had what appeared to be a broken collarbone and about six to seven slashes, about an inch deep. They would be heading to Smith County Community Hospital when the sheriff deputies arrived. They heard rustling in the woods and rushed toward the noise. What they saw is as retold to our Henrico office. We pulled up to the scene and saw the DWR truck with no CPO in sight. We heard some commotion in the woods and proceeded out to where the noise was coming from. When we came upon the scene, Joe was on the ground with a large wolf-like animal on him. We started to scream and make all sorts of racket to scare this creature off of Joe. This monstrous wolf-like creature stood up on its hind legs, straddling him. Per the sheriff deputies, this creature was staring right at them with a look of rage and malice. Saliva was hanging out of its snout. 
Both deputies had Remington 870 shotguns and proceeded to unload it on this wolfman. I was not there, of course, but saw these pictures of the end results. And it was not a pretty picture. Ten blasts from the 870s did not leave much left of that wolfman. The sheriff's office contacted us at the Henrico office, and we, or excuse me, my boss, contacted the proper agencies out of Virginia. From what I was told, roughly two hours, a helicopter landed at Richardson Ambulance, and an hour after that, some blacked-out SUVs and a black van showed up, cleaned up the scene, and took care of all of the loose ends. As far as that ham radio transmission, the creature was referred to as human wolf light creature. We now have been given code words for these things, so the public will not be aware of what is up. Jeff, thank you for looking into all of these strange disappearances and deaths in Virginia. Always remember, one person makes a difference. Today's second subscriber submission. Hello Jeffrey, I wanted to start off telling you that I followed and subscribed to your channel for about the last year. Memories of my encounter a little over 16 years ago were stirred up from the ambulance encounter you talked about. I was also contacted recently by the government agency and given the all clear to move back home when I am ready. This will become more clear in the telling of my encounter. Also to note, Robert is not my name. And this is a junk email, as I still work for a government service and do not want to be identified. Back in the fall of 2003, I was working as a sheriff deputy approximately 75 miles west of Denver, Colorado. I was young, new, fresh off field training, and almost off of probation. It was late afternoon, and I was dispatched to a call about a bear outside of a caller's home. I acknowledged the call and traveled to the location. I was less than five minutes out. A minute before arriving, I was called over the radio that a bear is now outside of another home. But this one was two miles away. I thought that's odd that a bear covered so much ground in such a short period of time. Backup was 15 minutes or more out, as there were only four deputies, including myself, on shift. I rerouted myself to the new call as the person on the phone had said it was outside of their house at this time. Upon my arrival, I pulled out my department-issued Remington 870. This was a loner as it was my supervisor's 14-inch barrel model. I ejected one round of buck and loaded a spear, one ounce high brass slug into the chamber followed by two more in the tube. My last two shots would be standard-issued federal premium copper-coated double-out buck. I knocked on the door, and a woman in her mid to late thirties answered. She was shaken and told me that a bear was outside her rear window of the house. She saw the back of the head and one eye looking at her inside the house. She said that when she had noticed it, it moved away from the window, growled, and hit or scratched the home. She wanted me to check the area out and make sure that it was gone as her two kids would be returning home from school. I don't remember what practice they were at, but they were at practice that day. I had maybe an hour of daylight left. I radioed to backup that I would check the area behind the house for the bear. Backup Deputy 1 was 5 to 7 minutes out from me, and backup Deputy 2 went to the other house for the first call. This was due to the first caller getting more and more scared and wanting a deputy there. Walking my way to the backyard, I looked at the window where the homeowner said she was at when she had seen this bear. The window was almost six feet up from where I was standing. I thought to myself, that would have to be a pretty big bear. I also noticed scratches in the siding of the home at the bottom of the window. They were pretty deep and five lines running from one to seven. I then made my way to the wood line past her backyard. I walked straight into the woods and came upon a small creek. The banks of the creek were several feet wide and the water running through it was approximately 10 feet wide to 6 to 8 inches deep. 
The bank of the creek rised approximately three feet on both sides. Following the creek about fifty yards into the forest, I saw a large brown furry animal walking away from me on all fours. At this time, I clicked off the safety to the shotgun. I was walking along the dry bank of the creek, trying to make my way up to firmer ground. But the bushes along the higher portion of the creek blocked me. I then moved my way toward a large tree along the bank, as just past it was an opening to higher ground. When I got to the tree, I switched the shotgun to my left hand and used my right to grab onto the tree. The animal heard me turned toward me and stood up. I then thought to myself that this was no friggin' bear. Just then a huge face of a wolf creature appeared literally a foot away from me from the brush by this tree. I was screwed. This was like the scene out of Jurassic Park where the raptor surprised the hunter from the side and kills him. I did the only thing I could think of, let go of the tree and fall to the bank below, just to create some space. The creature was too fast and grabbed my right arm and held me in place. Its massive hand covered three quarters of my forearm, and I felt searing hot pain of one of its claws penetrating my department coat, digging into the inside of my forearm. This creature looked into my eyes, grinned and growled or laughed, as it was the oddest growl I had ever heard. I used all of my strength in my left hand and wrenched the shotgun around to the point it at the creature, and I pulled the trigger. I don't think the creature saw the shotgun until it was too late. I nailed him right in the upper stomach. I was released and fell to the creek bed. I had an unusually soft landing or just didn't feel anything at that time. I switched the shotgun to my right hand, racked it, and fired at the only thing I could see its head. I saw a jawbone fly, and then it was quiet. I immediately remembered the other creature up on the creek, turned, and saw three more standing about thirty-five yards away. I racked the last slug into the chamber and fired at them. My round glanced the center creature's rib cage, and it let out a yelp. And I fired the last two rounds of buck, I know the spread hit all of them. They all darted up the opposite side of the creek from me, and out of sight I unholstered my Glock 21 and fired another six rounds at one of the creatures when it returned to the creek bank. It then ran back into the woods. Both of the other deputies heard the shots and came to my aid. I needed six stitches to close the cut on my forearm. Every off-duty deputy was called in to look for three more of these bear but nothing was found. The one body on the scene was guarded by a sheriff and his major. The feds showed up from Denver in about an hour, and I was asked a lot of questions, and asked multiple times if I were bit. I also had blood drawn three times over the next three days. I was told checking for rabies, which I know they weren't looking for. At the medical center, after getting stitched and cleared, up oh, Agent Bob, this is what I will call him to this day, in his thick southern accent came to me and told me that he was impressed that I did not die from coming upon four bear, and the one that I had killed was a very large one. He gave me a handwritten card with his number on it, told me to call him if I see any more of these bear I asked him if I should stock up on silver, kind of a tongue-in-cheek move on my part, telling him that I know what we are actually talking about. To my shock, he told me that wouldn't be a bad idea, but a slug to the head seemed to work. The sheriff came in and told me I was he was going to give me a commendation for protecting the public from these crazed bears, and to take the next six weeks off with pay to heal from my injury. Jeff, there is more to this experience, part two, sort of. If you want to hear about it, let me know, as the three other dogmen came back for me at my house during my time off. If not, just let me know. I don't want to bother you with my dumb stuff. The first dogman that grabbed me is described as all black with shades of gray mixed in the coat. The eyes were pure gold color. 
with small circular wisps of black. There was no eye shine as it was still daylight and it purposely got in my face to show dominance. In fact, it was so close I could see dark plaque build up on the front teeth of its canines and canines. The closest image is the one you use with the dog man face in the grass. The first time I saw that image, it gave me instant flashbacks. The way it looked at me and grabbed me, I saw extreme intelligence in its eyes. It was blind luck that I survived. If I did not click off that safety of that shotgun or maintain that firing grip when I transferred it to my left hand, I would not be here today. Before I left for the medical center, I was able to look at the body after my sector partner bandaged up my arm to control the bleeding. There was not much left of the face. The ears were like a German shepherd's, but with tufts at the peak. The hand almost reached to its knees. The hands were massive, and the claws did not look like they grew out like fingernails, but were an extension of the fingertips. I picked up the hand, and one of the deputies said, Should you do that? It might be carrying diseases. I said, Well, I already tangled with it, so I'm probably already done. The hand felt very leathery, and the claws were not really sharp, but with the force they are being driven at, it could cause some damage. This male had what I called like a slight chest puff, like a mini mane that some dogs have. The legs and feet looked like how you would look if you walked only on the balls of your feet, with the heel being more of a joint. Unlike a dog, this one had five toes, not four, but it still looked larger pawed foot. There was no tail that I could see, but the body was lying on its back. I stretched out the left leg and estimated the height to be approximately eight and a half feet tall. I'm not good with weight, but the feds needed two Kubotas to drag this thing out while raiding for a 3,500 3, truck. The second dog man, or dog person, was smaller in build than the first, but it was later found out to be a female. I believe this one was trying to distract me while the male sprung its trap. She was dark brown in color. The other two appeared to be male and both similar looking to the one I killed. Now that the description is out of the way, I'll move on to the rest of the experience and where I have been relocated by the feds. I was dropped off that evening to my small home. It was a nice 1,050 square acre, all brick, two bedroom, two bath, with three quarters of an acre. The perfect place for a single guy like me. My nearest neighbor was 600 yards away. My parents helped me purchase it when I got my job. My parents live in Denver. I was greeted by my small female German Shepherd Lucy. She was happy to see me but kept smelling me and she just kept tucking her tail after getting cleaned up and changed. She was all hugs and kisses after that. Next morning, I checked with the sheriff's office. When I pulled into the parking lot, I noticed at least six fed vehicles, a fed armored vehicle, like today's Bearcat. I went in, met with the sheriff. The sheriff handed me my commendation letter. He told me to read it carefully, as the feds were all over the office. He also told me that our federal friends were staying in town for the next few days to help the department try and locate any more bears. I went out to my car and took out my letter. Inside was a note that said to meet a clerk at the courthouse named Redacted. I traveled there to meet with Redacted. She handed me another envelope and told me to read it here. I opened the envelope and read the handwritten letter from the sheriff. It read as follows. Son, I can't help you in your time of need as my hands are tied and I'm being watched. So are you. The agents are using you as bait. You are being followed by them, but I don't think they were here to protect you. Protect yourself however you can. Do not leave and go home to your parents, as others may come back for you. When we get through this, we can have a talk on what I know. You have one down, six more to go. After I was done reading it, she shredded it and flushed it down the toilet. 
Over the next week, I went to all my doctor appointments, which were held in a mobile command bus by a doctor I had never seen. She was nice, but barely said a word. Agent Bob stopped by and asked if everything was okay at home. I told him everything was fine. He said, great. And on his way out, he looked back at me and said, trust your dog. I always carried my Glock 21 with three additional mags, and at home I loaded my personal Remington 1187P shotgun, similar to the one I carry at work, but this one was semi-automatic and held 7 plus 1. I loaded it full of slugs and set it by my bedroom door. Thank you, Pops, for the Police Academy graduation present. On night 11, I was woken at about 2 in the morning. My dog was whimpering and growling. I could hear what sounded like multiple footsteps outside of the house. I had my blinds closed in my bedroom and didn't want to open them. I went over and picked up my shotgun, rechecked it, clicked off the safety, opened my bedroom door. My dog ran out to the living room and dining area. She immediately locked on the back window. She tucked her tail and was frozen. But it was like she couldn't decide whether to bark or run. I had a desk set up in the dining area, as this was where my computer was. I had a small desk lamp on it next to the computer, while still in the hallway, which was dark, and around the corner I used a mirror on the opposite wall to look at the window. I saw the head of the female dogman looking in the window with a side-eyed stare, like how a real angry dog will warn you that they are going to bite. This time, I could see the gold reflection of its eyes. I whispered the command to speak to my dog. She went ape-crazy, barking. I then heard both my bedroom windows shattering. And I popped from the hallway corner, lined up the rifle sight on my shotgun and pulled the trigger. The window was blown outward. I then swung the shotgun back toward the bedroom, but I couldn't find anything to shoot at. I then heard a diesel engine race up and stop. Then I started to hear suppressed gunfire all around my home. After a few minutes, Agent Bob knocked on my door. He told me that was it. I saw six men dressed in full SWAT gear with suppressed AR-10s. Agent Bob had me walk with him to my backyard, and on the ground was a female. Agent Bob then said, you bagged us a girl. Thanks, I've been needing one of them. They're hard to find. There were two more bodies in the woods just behind my house. He said two got away. Bob was a little more open to me now. He never said what they were other than bear, but told me that if he could, he would eradicate all of them. But people want to research and air support would be drawn too much attention. He told me that I could not stay here because I'm a marked man. It took a few days, but my house went, was purchased by them, and I was moved to a desert city. They put in a good word for me to my new department. I was quickly hired and started my new job. And I am now a high rank like brass on the collar rank, so I don't want to come out as crazy. Agent Bob gave me some very specific instructions to visit my parents. One was always fly into Denver, never drive, never go back to the county I worked or surrounding counties. Once a year they'd ask me for some old, worn, unlaundered clothes. Bob retired in 2015. He told me in one of my yearly checks. I don't know what happened in July 19th, but I was con. I don't know what happened July of 2019, but I was contacted and told that any bears that may remember me had been taken care of, and all requests travel, and all requested travel restrictions have been lifted. I will no longer be contacted by them. That's it, Jeff. You now know everything I know. Cover up, yes, for good reason. I believe so. Can they be killed? Yes, but only if you have luck and speed on your side and an awesome dog. R.I.P. Loyal Lucy. Finally, I feel that since. He Everything is over now. I can tell my story and the feds are not going to care, as I'll sound crazy. The others in my group feel the same as none of us signed any non-disclosure agreements. I think the feds know if we come out with our stories, we will just lose our jobs and look like kooks. Then I emailed him 
Hello, I'd like to have you share your experiences with me on the channel. That way people can hear you. Please let me know. And he finally responded. It took him some time. Jeff, I'm sorry I have not gotten back to you more recently. Also, with current events, I'm working nights and out on the streets. I'm a lieutenant now and on the promotion list for captain. I'm planning on retiring in four years when I hit my 20. I wish I could go on your show, but my voice is pretty recognizable. I've been on TV a few times. Also, I was contacted by my last handler and told not to share too much more than I already had, as some of what I said can currently affect their operations. I can talk with you about my incident, but cannot divulge anything related to what they were currently doing or have done recently. They are listening to your channel. Victor may be in the same organization, but that's beyond my knowledge. Agent Bob is kind of like a more serious combo of Jeff Bridges from RIPD and Alton Brown's impersonation of Colonel Sanders. I've always liked him as I thought he bent the rules to ensure my success in surviving the revenge attack of these dogmen. When he said, trust your dog, he was telling me that she would be my early warning system. I've always had a dog since Lucy. I always wanted to add that Lucy passed away of old age in 2012. Whenever I go into a wooded environment, I now carry my Glock 20 and 10 millimeter with some really hot loads. I also carry a 4570 Marlin 1895 SBL with 430 grain P-loads. Since my encounter, the few times I have camped with family has been in Montana, Utah, and Idaho. I've never had a run-in with any other cryptid. Also, for insurance myself, I have half of that jawbone recovered from the scene. I have it geocached in a location only myself and two other people have. If you have any additional questions about my encounter, please feel free to ask. All right, guys. So really quick, if anyone's wondering what the ambulance encounter is, uh, that is an encounter that happened in Connecticut. And uh, two paramedics were heading to a location, got a call that the call had been canceled, and we're heading back in a rural, very rural part of Connecticut, uh, kind of like a one stop sign, stop sign town. And <clears throat> they ended up seeing this wolf or dog, huge animal in front of them. And as they went to pass it, it jumped off into the hedgerow, which was a good six to seven feet. Um, it freaked the passenger out. The driver was freaked out for a long time. Anyway, like something like nine years later, the driver of the uh, ambulance reached out to his partner again and said, hey, this is what happened. When we first saw the first one, there were two behind us and he was switching through the cameras uh, on the ambulance and then as he switched to the other camera lit up the scene lights he saw a dog man not five feet away from the passenger side window and if it had been opened it probably would have pulled the person right out of the window and gone it was the evilest looking creature uh, it smiled at the driver when he realized it, he could see it and just mad dashed it. So, And there you have it, folks, this early morning, middle of the night bonus. I do hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. And I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going and what gives us all a place and a chance to share our experiences and theories judgment free. Just simply treat it with the respect we all deserve. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about. 
and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.